the instantaneous rate of change of a function f of x at x equal to a, and it is the limit of the average rate of change over shorter and shorter intervals around a. So let's look at an example to make this a little bit clearer. When we did average rate of change on a data table, which is what we'll look at, we took two points and we found the rate of change or the slope, change in y over change in x. That's exactly what we do with instantaneous rate of change, but the key here is the shorter and shorter intervals around A. So let's look at our first example. What we want to do is find the instantaneous rate of change at x equal to 4. So let's look at our data. Let's look at 0, 2, 4, and 6 for the x's. And for the y values, at 0 is 54, at 2 is 75, at 4 is 90, at 6 is 102. Now also notice that these values are equally spaced. So that is important here as well as in some other applications. Our x values are equally spaced. And I want to find the rate of change at x equal to 4. So this is what I'm looking for right here. And in the lessons you learn about the shortcut method, which you can use if you have equally spaced x's around the point of interest. So a is equal to 4. And I'm going to use the values at 2 and at 6 because they are both x's or two units apart. And that's what I use to get my rate of change. So in this case, it's going to be the instantaneous rate of change. But we actually work it the same way that we do with average rate of change. 6 minus 2 put my x's in first, the y value that goes with 6 is 102, the y value that goes with 2 is 75. So see, it's not a very big difference. I have 4 in the denominator, 27 in the numerator. When I divide that out, I find that the instantaneous rate of change at x equal to 4 for this data set is 6.75, and this is just y units per x units. So instantaneous rate of change is not a terribly new concept. It just follows from average rate of change. We'll just see how much more involved it can be. Now I will mention, if your x's are not equally spaced, you have to go through a different process. We would have to find the rate of change to the left, of 4 and the rate of change to the right of 4 and then average the two together. Add the two rates of change and divide by 2 to get an average of those rates of change. The shortcut method is what this is called and that's what you want to be using as much as possible. Shortcut method. Let's look at another example of the instantaneous rate of change. In this case, we're not given a data table, but we probably want to set one up because there's so much information in this problem. The instantaneous rate of change of f of x at x equal to 2 is negative 0.5. Further, we know that f of 0 equals 5 and f of 2 equals 2. What is f of 4? <coughs> So we really need to organize all that information. I have x values at 2 and 0 and 4. So I know that I need a data table that has those three x's in it, 0, 2, and 4. I'm given that the instantaneous rate of change at x equal to 2 is negative 0.5 
but I don't really have a place in a data table usually to put instantaneous rate of change. I do have a place to put my Y values or my F values. So let's look at that. When X is 0, the F value is 5. When X is 2, the X value is 2. When X is 4, I don't know what that is. That's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to call that Y because that is the number that I'm looking for. Now, 0, 2, and 4, when you look at those, you can see that it's two units here and two units between 2 and 4, so they are equally spaced around the center point. That means that we can use the shortcut method to get the instantaneous rate of change. And I know I have to do that formula because it tells me something about the instantaneous rate of change. So, instantaneous rate of change will be the difference between the two y's that are equally spaced around the x we want. I'll have in the denominator 4 minus 0 for the x's on top y minus 5. And I'm given the instantaneous rate of change. I know that that is negative 0.5. So I can take this whole fraction and set it equal to negative 0 0.5 so that I have this equation. Well, let's see, y minus 5, the denominator is 4. I can multiply across to get rid of that. So I'd have y minus 5 equals 4 times the negative 0.5, half of 4 is 2. So that y is equal to negative 2 plus 5 is 3. So the function value that I'm looking for is 3. So to answer the question, what is f of 4? f of 4 is equal to 3. I had to use the formula for the instantaneous rate of change. Change in y over change in x. I did not have to use this value for 2 because the shortcut just says use the ones on the ends, equally spaced x's away from the center point. And that's the shortcut method, and that's a very quick way to solve this problem. We're still looking at instantaneous rate of change. In this case, we're going to start looking at it graphically. So we want to back up and look at average rate of change on a graph. Average rate of change is the slope of the secant line. That is the line between two separate points on a graph. But if we think about Q as a point that could move closer to P, so it's here and I have a different line, and it's here and I have a different line, so that when I get right to point P, the secant line really hits just at one point and becomes a tangent line. That's what we call the line that just touches the graph at a particular point P. Now, it's possible that our graph could go down and come back up so that it would touch the same line at a different point, but that still doesn't mean that it's not just tangent at point P. So this is the tan tangent line to the curve at point P, and we think about that as being the result of the secant lines approaching the tangent line, so that we can say that the instantaneous rate of change is the limit um, is the slope of the tangent line and is the limit of the slopes is the limit of the secant line secant lines so that the secant lines approach the tangent line. And they can approach from the other side. If my graph continued on, an, on the other direction, I could have secant lines on this side that also approach the tangent line. There are excellent graphs like this in the lesson, so be sure to look at those. 
So we have two ways now that we think of our instantaneous rate of change. We can think of it as the slope of a tangent line. That's the result of all the secant lines approaching it as a limit. And we can also think of it as the rates of change, the limits of the average rates of change getting closer and closer and closer and closer to our particular point. And the rate of change at a particular point is the instantaneous rate of change. And we'll look at tangent lines at two different points. And we want to find the instantaneous rate of change at, say, this point right here. And then we'll do another instantaneous rate of change at this point. So because we want the instantaneous rate of change at a point, that will be the slope of the tangent line. So what we have to find is slope of tangent. So let's look at this point first. And we have been saying to find a rate of change, you take a point for an instantaneous rate of change, the same distance on either side. But we know on a graph, we want the slope of the tangent line. So we are actually going to use the point of tangency, this point A, F of A, as one of our points. And let's see if we can figure out what that is. So here, that looks like it might be maybe, I think I'm going to call it six and one-third. No, that's seven over there, six and a half. So let's call this the point 6.5 for x and maybe 12, um, maybe 13. Looks a little higher than 12. 10, 15, yeah, call that 13. So that's one of the points where the line is tangent to the curve. The other point we pick on the line, and if you extend the line over here, I found that it actually crossed at a grid crossing. And so I know exactly what that point is. That's the point 10, 20. So those are the two points that will give me the slope for my red line. So let's find that slope. In the denominator, I have my two x values, 10 minus 6.5. And in the numerator, the y values, 20 minus 13. So 20 minus 13 is 7. 10 minus 6.5 is 3.5, which gives me 2. So the instantaneous rate of change of the red line is 2. And this is an estimate. Um, when you actually draw a tangent line, you have to be very careful that you do try to make it look like it touches at one point, and you can have a little bit of change, a little wiggle room in there. So this just takes practice to try to get an accurate answer. Let's look at this blue line over here. The point of tangency here looks like maybe x is 1, and y is eh, way up there, let's say 9. And another point, I drew this one. This was not a good place to stop, but I kept going, and I ended up up here at x equal to 4 and y equal to 30. So let's see what that's going to be. If I do the instantaneous rate of change, my x's are 4 minus 1. My y's are 30 minus 9 gives me 21 over 3, which is equal to 7. And it's really not very likely that you're going to end up with integers like this. This worked out better than I thought it would. Um, decimals are not uncommon, so you do have to be very careful. So I have a rate of change of 7 here versus a rate of change of 2. But let's look at that. This is a pretty steep line. So this one is steep. It's got a higher rate of change. This one Still a positive slope, think of a line, a positive slope, but it's not as steep, has a smaller rate of change. Um, what about this one right here? Suppose I try to find, if it's tangent here, the one thing I immediately know about this one is the slope is negative. This has a slope less than zero because it's a line that's decreasing. 
So if I wanted to put these in some kind of order, say decreasing order of rates of change, I would have the 7 first, and then the 2, and then whatever my negative number is, whichever slope that would be, would tell me the order, a steep line, a not-so-steep line, and a line that's so steep it's got a negative slope, but it's still not very steep. It has a negative slope. Okay? So think about tangent lines as lines and slopes. And it really is not too much of a problem if you do a lot of practice. So to refresh your memory, average rate of change on an interval. We also found that the average rate of change on an interval represented the slope of a secant line, and that was between two points. And another way to write the slope of a secant line in symbols was called the difference quotient. And that was f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. And we found that if we took the limits of all the rates of change on shorter and shorter intervals, and we took the limits of the secant lines as they got closer and closer to a tangent line, um, we ended up with an instantaneous rate of change. And we're going to take the limit of our difference quotient also. So if we take limits of all of these, what we end up with is the instantaneous rate of change at a point. x equal to a. Slope of a tangent line at a. And if we take the limit of the difference quotient as h goes to 0, the limit of the difference quotient, that is the limit as h goes to 0, remember h is the little distance on either side of point A of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. That's the same thing. It's the instantaneous rate of change. It's the slope of a tangent line at a. It's the limit of the difference quotient at a. Well, now all of these are something new. Altogether, these are the derivative at a point A. So my limit of my difference quotient, I can call that F prime of A. It gives me a number, and that is the derivative at that point. There's Three different things that we work with. We work with f of x. That is equal to a function in x's. So we have y equals 2x squared plus 5, or f of x equals negative 3x minus 2a, uh, minus 2, excuse me. That's a function in x. We can write f of a, which is a number that you get from plugging the number a into your function in x. And now we have f prime of a. And that is the derivative at the point when x is equal to a. And it's the result of our limit definition. So we have a lot of things that mean derivative that come from the things that were the average rates.
in this example, g of v is the fuel efficiency in miles per gallon of a car moving v miles per hour. So if I have g prime of 55 equal to negative 0.54, let's see if we can see what that's really telling us. So g is the fuel efficiency. g prime is instantaneous rate of change. And so what I have to do is think about how my units work out. So if I have instantaneous rate of change, my units in the numerator are of g. And so my units for g are miles per gallon. That's the output, because when you think of a slope, you think of, I mean, a rate of change is a slope, and you think of change in function change over change in variable, change in y over change in x. My v units are miles per hour. So I have a change that's miles per gallon, another change that's miles per hour, um, so when you, when you try to get these to work out, um, what we'll have here is that the input is 55 miles per hour, okay? So that's what we'd have, um, usually per hour would be one hour. Negative 0.54 is the value of my g prime. I'll put an arrow here. Negative 0 0.54. So when I look at this, I'm just looking at my units for my result. I have put in 55. If it's miles per hour and it is a 1 in the bottom, which is what this is. This is 0 0.54 over 1. It's not like equal to, if this were equal to 2 thirds, I'd have 2 miles per gallon over a change of 3 miles per hour. Now, this 1 is an increase of 1 mile per hour. Increase speed, velocity, speed, 1 mile per hour. So that talks about going from 55 to 56. I'm increasing my speed one mile per hour. The fuel efficiency, fuel efficiency, decreases. That's what the negative tells us by 0.54 miles per gallon. Okay, if this is miles per gallon, miles per gallon, increase the speed one mile, you lose a half mile per gallon. So if you're trying to get to a gas station, speeding up may not be the thing to do because every mile per hour faster at 55. You lose a little over half a mile for each gallon you have left. Now that's at 55. If you're driving 65, um, this is probably an even larger negative number because the faster you go, the less fuel efficiency you have. But this is how we would interpret this. It's really important to think of what the units are, output over input, and if you can reduce it to a fraction and put a 1 in the bottom, then you're increasing your input by 1 mile per hour or 1 of whatever the unit is. Makes it easier to work with. The number that's left is the fuel efficiency. Okay. Suppose the height in inches of a person t years old is h of t. 
h is the height at t years old. So h of 10 would be the height of a person 10 years old. Now let's say for 10 years old, let's say on the 10th birthday. So the height of a person 10 years old on the 10th birthday is, equal sign means is, 51 inches. Now 51 inches would be, 48 inches is 4 feet, so this is the same as 4 feet 3 inches. So we've got a 10-year-old who is ten, uh, on his birthday, or her birthday, is about 51 inches tall. And um, about that age, boys and girls are about the same height. So this could be a male or female child. Um, so that's a function value. We have an, an f of a. We've evaluated the function and got a, an output number. Suppose that we're also told that h prime of 10 is 2 inches. So I have these two points, these two bits of notation. h prime of 10 is 2 inches. What does that mean? That's what we're looking at. Let's interpret what this derivative means. Now, derivative is an instantaneous rate of change. This is a rate of change. So if I look at a rate of change, rate of change gives me output units over input units. The x's are the input, or the t's in this case. The output are the f's or the y's, or the h's. So my output units, in this case, are inches. Um, my input units, my 10, is years, the age in years. So my rate of change is so many inches over so many years. Okay. So if it's inches per year, well, I should say the change in inches over the change in years, right? Input is change. And so I'm going to write, just so I'm don't confuse math type people. I'm going to put a delta here. Change in output over change in input. All right? Um, inches over years is inches per year. That's another way to read this as inches per year. Well, my inches per year is two. So this is two inches per year at 10 years, on the 10th birthday. So that means the child will grow about two inches until the next birthday, until the 11th birthday. Two inches over one year from the 10th birthday to the 11th birthday, the child should grow about two inches. This interprets that, that derivative. That's what this means. Input is years, 10 year old, about two inches in change in height over the next year. Child will grow about two inches until he hits his 11th birthday or her 11th birthday. Okay. Now, after that, let's see, let's guess. I know it's hard to guess in math. Math should be exact, but let's guess. Suppose we want to figure out what's going to happen. Um, guess about h prime of 40. 40 over the hill. When you hit 40, what's happened to your height? Are you still growing? Probably not in height. Usually by the time you've hit 40, 25, 20, depends. Males and females do change. The rates of change slow quicker for, for girls than boys. But by the time people are 40 of either sex, their height is fairly steady. They haven't really changed. So if they're not growing, but they're not yet shrinking, this would be zero. The derivative, the rate of change 
at age 40 is zero inches per year. Let's think about one more. H prime of 70. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think I can say equals here. I might could. Sometimes by the time you hit 70, your spine's compacted. You're beginning to shrink a little bit. Um, so I would say this could be maybe even minus 0.5, minus a half an inch, or maybe minus an inch, depending. This assumes you don't have a degenerative spinal disease that shrinks you even faster. But probably the rate of change in your height at age 70 is a negative number. So that means um, losing inches or inches, inch, inches per year. So by the time you hit this age, it's going down. So a function doesn't have just one rate of change unless it's a, a straight line, a horizontal line. Um, height goes up and down, grow, stay the same, shrink. But this is how you would interpret this particular function if H is the height and inches of a person two years old.